All right, friends, let's try to bring our year-long study in the book of James to a close tonight. James chapter 5. If you're new and you wonder why they're laughing, it's because I've been gone a lot this summer, so five chapters has turned into like a, you know, a, a very long study. But we are in chapter 5, and Lord willing, we're going to close it tonight. If you need a Bible, our ushers have Bibles as they come down the aisles, just raise a hand if you'd like to receive a Bible from them. James chapter 5 is page 1186 in the church Bibles. So we left off at, um, right at verse 7, and so we're going to look at verses 7 through the end of the chapter, and what I'd like to do is just read uh, the, all of these verses from verse 7 through the end, and then come back and we'll, we'll look at, um, at what James has to say here in these closing few verses. So James chapter five, starting at verse seven. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, But let your yes be yes, and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven." Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, Let him know that he who turns the sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Let's pause there and pray. Father, we thank you for this evening as we gather here in your house, as we look into these closing verses in the book of James. We thank you for the inspiration of your Holy Spirit through the pen of James, and we just pray that we would take to heart these things, Lord that we would be stretched in our faith, that we would grow in our relationship with you, maybe for some that they would come into a relationship with you for the very first time. So we we thank you that you're so gracious toward us, and we pray now that you would use this time in your word to strengthen our hearts. We love you and we praise you together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. What we have here in the, in the closing chapter of the book of James are, by my count, but I suppose you could dig out even further than what I did, seven exhortations uh, in, in these final closing verses where James just, you know, before he signs off here, he's, he's giving some exhortations, some instructions, some directives for us as Christians. And uh, so I'm going to go through these seven with you tonight. And the first one is that he calls us to wait patiently. And, and that's here in verses 7 and 8, where he says, therefore, be patient, circle that in your Bibles, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently, there's the word again, for it until it receives the early and latter rains. You also be patient, there it is a third time, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. And so the word patient or some form of that word appears three times here in verses seven and eight. And uh, patience is not just a virtue. We go around saying that patience is a virtue, patience is a virtue. It's also a discipline. Patience is not just a virtue, it's also a discipline. Now it is a virtue in that when you know the Lord and you have his spirit within you, 
One of the fruit of the Spirit is patience. In Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23, it lists the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. Some of your rivals say long-suffering. That's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be patient. It is a virtue in our walk with the Lord. Patience should naturally identify us as belonging to Him because it's part of the fruit of the Spirit. But it's also discipline. Uh, you have to practice patience. You have to discipline your lives to be patient. And I don't know about you, but the more you know, fast-paced our culture gets, the more impatient I become. Have you ever been frustrated at like the drive-through? You know, at some, you know, McDon I mean, I'm not saying that I support McDonald's, but I do. Um, <laughs> my cholesterol's been a little low lately, so I just need to get it up there. And uh, so, you know, a, a good greasy hamburger once in a while doesn't hurt, but I mean, what's the harm? It'll just take me to heaven quicker. But anyway, uh, I found myself impatient at, at the weirdest times. You ever been impatient at a microwave? <laughs> and we have everything at our disposal now. It's instant oatmeal, instant rice, you know, instant everything. And yet we are just some of the most impatient people. And so patience is also not just a virtue, it's also a discipline. The Bible commands us, here's a verse for you, Colossians 3.12, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. We are told to clothe ourselves. We have to put on patience. If you don't find yourself naturally a patient person, it is a discipline of your faith. So put on patience. Now, in the context of what James is writing here, he doesn't just simply say, be patient for patience's sake. He's specific here. He says, be patient until the Lord's coming. Did you check that out in verse seven? And again in verse eight, he uses the reference to the coming of the Lord. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. And at the end of verse eight, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. And so he speaks here about being patient, waiting for the Lord's coming. Now, obviously we're closer to the Lord's coming today than we were in James' day. And James yet says it's at hand, which means we should always be living in the careful expectation of the imminent return of Christ. Amen. That should be the ongoing disposition of every Christian. We should always be waiting for the imminent return of Christ and living our lives in such a way that he could return at any moment. Amen. And that, that challenges us, John would write in, in his epistle, that challenges us to holy living. Because if you are living constantly with the expectation of the imminent return of Christ, I guarantee you, you're not gonna be doing some of the things that you might normally do. If we continue to keep in the forefront of our minds and hearts, Jesus could return at any time, and he could. Jesus could return at any time, he could return at any time. It, it will help us to live a life of holiness walking in, in purity before the Lord because we know, okay, he could return any time. So I don't, want to, I don't want to be found unfaithful. I want to be watching and ready and living my life in such a way that it honors him. And so James is saying to the early church here, I want you to be living in such a way patiently longing for and looking for the imminent return of Christ. And in that context, he's also talking about the idea of suffering. Because, you know, remember, again, and this is sometimes hard for us in, in the comfort of our Western American lifestyles in Loudoun County to imagine, but there are plenty of people in the first century and on, including today, who are in constant threat of death and persecution and suffering for their faith. But because we're sometimes so far removed from it, we lose sight of the fact that there are actually Christians suffering around the world. And more Christians have been martyred for their faith in the last century than in the previous 20 combined. So, you know, we're, we're living in a time when Christians are persecuted for their faith. And with that in mind, the context here is, I want you to be patient because the Lord is going to return, but he links, he marries suffering with patience in verse 10. You can just glance ahead at verse 10 because he says, my brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. See how he marries those two? He talks about suffering and patience. Now, we'll talk about suffering in a minute when we get to verse 10. But the idea here is he's not saying be patient for patience sake only. And he's not only saying be patient because you're waiting for the coming of the Lord. He's saying be patient in this lifetime because this world will be taxing at times, burdensome at times. You will experience suffering at times. So be patient because Jesus is coming again. That's the full context of what he's saying. Be patient, folks. Because this world is sometimes 
troubling to us, right? It's hard sometimes. There are difficulties that come into our lives. There are hardships. The reality of suffering is a reality. And so in all of that, he's saying, be patient, even though you're going to experience some suffering because Jesus is coming again. And so we need to be practicing this and we need to wait patiently. And and this is why he ends verse 8 by saying, establish your hearts. Establish your hearts. And that word establish in the Greek means to make strong, to set fast. Uh, it's the idea of, of like when you, when you take concrete and you, you're, first, you know, you're first mixing it and it hasn't hardened yet. It's still soft, but uh, you know, eventually in, in time it becomes set. And so in a similar way, he's saying, listen, don't let your hearts be you know, tossed by this world establish your hearts, like set your hearts, be patient. Uh, Life can be burdensome and hard and difficult and include some suffering, but be patient, establish your hearts, uh, make them immovable. Uh, The Lord is coming. And within this exhortation, he compares patience to a farmer. And, and, he's, and he says there about how farmers, you know, they wait, verse 7, for the precious fruit of the earth. They wait patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. You know, a farmer doesn't get the produce overnight. It takes time. And there has to be this, you know, there's the, the tilling of the soil, then there's the planting of the seed, then there's the germination of the seed, and then it begins to grow, and then, and then it becomes fruitful. All of that takes time. And so in that whole scenario, he's saying here, take a lesson from the farmer. Things don't happen overnight. Be patient in the face of suffering. Jesus is coming again. So that's number one. Number two, he says, avoid grumbling. In verse nine, Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Um, In in King James, I'm reading New King James, but in King James it says, do not grudge one another. It's interesting. It's it's a take on on the Greek word stenadzo. And stenadzo means to sigh, to murmur, to complain. And he says it in relation to one another. He says, don't grumble against one another or don't literally grudge one another. Don't have a grudge towards each other. Now, you know, when you, when, you, when you look in the Bible at the number of times the word grumble is used, uh, the predominant time that the word is used is in relation to when the Israelites grumbled against God. You remember that whole scene when God was moving them from Egypt after slavery, and they're in the wilderness, and they're on their way to the promised land, and they just start grumbling against God. They start murmuring. They start complaining. They they, they, they're dissatisfied with, uh, with the food. They're complaining about the manna. They're complaining about there's not enough water. You know, it's hot. You know, and they're, they're just complaining and grumbling, and they're, they're not grateful, which is the whole idea behind grumbling, right? It's the opposite. It's like if you're grumbling, you're not grateful. You can't grumble and be grateful at the same time. And so what happened with the Israelites, how they served as an example to us, when they grumbled, what did God do? He let them die. He's like, you, you don't like your circumstances here in the wilderness? Fine, then you can die here. You don't have to move on. You don't have to trust me for what's ahead. If you, if you grumble, if you complain, if you don't like my supply, if you don't like my provision, if you don't like my care for you, you could just die. And that's what they did. They died in the wilderness. And Psalm 103 verse 25 tells us that they grumbled in their tents and did not obey the Lord during the wilderness wanderings on their way from Egypt to the promised land. So the Lord let them die in the desert. He doesn't like complaining is my point. The Bible makes it clear that he doesn't like when we grumble. Now, in that scene with the Israelites and God, they're grumbling against God. Well, guess what? He doesn't like it when we grumble about each other either. He just doesn't like grumbling at all. So we need to stop this kind of thing. If you, if you complain about one another, you're dishonoring God. You, and, and this is why, you know, he adds here uh, at the rest of verse 9, behold, the judge is standing at the, at the door. Because in effect, when we grumble about one another, we're judging one another. And we talked a few weeks ago about the difference, the difference between uh, judging someone and being judgmental. Sometimes we do need to be discerning in a, in a right judging kind of a way. But then there's a wrong judging kind of a way when we're judgmental. 
And we talked about the distinction between the two, and that's the kind of thing that he's alluding to here. You're, you get judgmental when you start grumbling about people, complaining about people, gossiping about people. So stop that, because God hears it. He doesn't like when we grumble against him. He doesn't like when we grumble against one another. So James is just kind of reinforcing this. Number three, he tells us here, endure suffering. In verse 10, my brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering, there's the word, and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. So here he talks about suffering, and again, he marries the idea of suffering and patience, and he uses two examples. Uh, he uses the prophets as an example, and then he specifically uses Job as an example. Now, first the prophets. The prophets did have their share of suffering. I mean, you, you look in the Bible and you, you look at the Old Testament prophets, um, most of them were killed. Uh, and if they weren't killed, they were certainly uh, persecuted. You know, a guy like Jeremiah, we just finished the book of Jeremiah a few months ago on Sunday mornings, and you know, he was beaten often, uh, thrown into a pit, mistreated. Uh, he suffered a lot for the kingdom. Um, he was called the weeping prophet. He, you know, he wept over the sins of his own people, and they mistreated him for just speaking the truth. Uh, church uh, history says, not the Bible, but church history says that Isaiah was sawed in two. Um, so, you know, they experienced their share of suffering and persecution and death. And James says, just remember those prophets? You know, they were so faithful to God in the face of suffering that they still persevered. They didn't give up. They were faithful to God. And so, to whatever degree you might experience suffering, endure it. Endure it. And then he sp specifically mentions Job here. Now, there's a whole book of the Bible named after that guy. And... Um, <laughs> It's one of those books of the Bible, you know, if you've been here long enough at Cornerstone, you know that we go straight through the Bible from cover to cover. So, you know, I don't avoid Job. Um, we come to it when we're going straight through the Bible. But I also would not necessarily decide to start there. You know, I'm going to hit it because we're going through the Bible. There's a reason why God put the book of Job in the Bible, but it's not the most encouraging book. I mean, at the very end it is, but there's still a lot of tragedy and heartache in the, in the whole thing that by the end, you're, you're still feeling raw and you're feeling, you know, like your heart's breaking for this guy. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Job, basically here's a guy who was, in fact, in Job 1.1, it uses four words to describe this guy. It says that he was blameless. It says that he was upright. Literally, he was straight. It means in the Hebrew that nothing crooked about him. He feared God, that's three, and number four, he shunned evil. So he's a pretty righteous dude, you know, <laughs> sounds very California, but he's, he's, you know, a very, very uh, righteous guy walking with the Lord, blameless, upright, feared God, shunned evil. Uh, the book of Job tells us that he was married, he had 10 kids, seven boys and three girls, and he was very wealthy, not in terms necessarily of like uh, money, but in terms of livestock and um, and, and crops and vineyards, that's how they measured wealth in those days primarily. And so that's this guy's life. Now we have the perspective of knowing something that Job doesn't know at the time, which is that Satan has approached God and asked God's permission to test him and torment him and tempt him. And God allows Satan. God gives Satan limited permission. By the way, Satan, you know, learn from this. Satan does not have free reign over your life, okay? Everything, you know, Satan has been disarmed at the cross, okay? He's, he's not a defeated foe, he's a disarmed foe. He will eventually be seized, captured, bound for a thousand years, released again, and then thrown into the lake of fire forever and ever, okay? But, but he, he does not have this unlimited, um, you know, reign over your life. Uh, as much as he will try everything he can to oppress you, tempt you. It's not like, you know, Satan has free reign. He has to ask permission of God to have the kind of um, limited effect upon Job that, that he ends up having. And the reason that God allows this, you know, poor Job, but the reason God allows this, we, we have the benefit of seeing from 30,000 feet, 
is that it's going to serve to be for us an encouragement and a reminder of a guy who was faithful in the face of suffering. I mean, the book of Job is a tale of torment. This guy loses everything. He loses everything related to his material wealth, and he, and he loses all of his kids. All his kids die. The only one left standing is his wife, and she says to Job, why don't you just curse God and die? You ever wondered why Satan let her alone? Because. She's, you know, it's, Job went from, with, with this wife, he went from the engagement ring to the wedding ring to the suffering. That's what happened. And so Satan's like, I'm just going to leave her there. Yeah, she's working pretty good. You know, so, so she, she's like this, she's not very encouraging at all. She says, why don't you just curse God and die? And so Satan leaves her alone because she's a good weapon against him. But he's lost everything. And this guy, and he breaks out with, you know, sores and, and he's, he's just despondent. And then he has friends who aren't really friends because then his friends come to him and say, there must be sin in your life, Job. You know, that's the problem with you. You wouldn't be having this problem unless there was sin in your life. There must be sin in your life. It's sin. That's what it is. It's sin. <laughs> you ever had, you know, your Christian friends tell you that kind of nonsense? There must be sin. Listen, no mistake about it. Sometimes sin can lead to hardships in our life, clearly. But for people to always use this blanket statement that the reason you're suffering is because there must be sin in your life, that's a terrible thing to say. And so Job's friends were no friends at all. They misrepresent God. Their theology is whack. And, they, and they're trying to convince Job that there's sin in his life. Long story short, Job, the Bible says, never sinned against God. In all of this suffering, Job 122, in all of this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. And so James says, I want you to remember, Job, that when times get tough, persevere. Lean into the Lord. Don't blame the Lord. Don't get mad with God. Sometimes we don't see everything that's happening. Sometimes, sometimes because our perspective is only this much, right, we don't always know what's going on and what the ultimate outcome will be. You know, Paul would, uh, would uh, tell us in Romans 8.18, he says, our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us in Christ Jesus. Amen. And that's the right perspective we need to always maintain, that sometimes there will be suffering in this life. I mean, Jesus even said in John 16.33, he said, these things have I spoken to you that in me you have, that you might have peace. In this world you will have trouble or tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. So suffering and tribulation should not surprise us to one degree or another, we will all experience it in our lives, in relationships, in, in health, in, in you know, all kinds of things, all right? It isn't that God has abandoned us. It isn't that God doesn't love us. It isn't that God doesn't care. And we can spend a lot of time asking why. And what I have found, even though, comparatively speaking, I've not experienced the degree of suffering that I know a lot of other people have, a lot of you, a lot of others, what I have found is a better question to ask is not why, Lord, but what are you trying to teach me? What were you trying to show me? You know, how, how are you trying to grow me? That's what I mean by what are you trying to teach me? There's a multitude of ways that God is trying to reveal himself to us in, in different ways. And sometimes that can only be learned through suffering. I, I don't know about you, but some of the greater lessons I've learned in my life are not in the good times, but in the difficult times. Some of the greater things about God that I've learned, some of the greater aspects of his character and his nature, I've learned through difficult times, not the good times. I'm thankful for the good times. Don't get me wrong. I, I pray always for the good times. Who, who really wants the bad times? You know, I don't, you know, take heart, you know, you, in this world you will have tribulation. But take, I don't put that verse up on the refrigerator, right? You know, but nevertheless, I'm comforted by the reminder that in this world we will have our share of difficulties but God is still on the throne. And, and Lord, reveal yourself to me through this difficulty that I might lean into you and understand you better. So endure suffering is his exhortation to us. Number four, he goes on here to tell us, number four, to speak honestly, to speak honestly. Verse 12, 
But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. Uh, by the way, I've had some people ask me, does this mean you should never, you know, put your hand in a Bible, swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. That, that's not what this is saying. You, you, can, you can, you know, swear an oath in that sense. What, what he's saying here is, when he, when he adds this, that your yes be yes and no, no, is be a person of your word. That's what he means. Be a person of your word. Be a man of your word. Be a woman of your word. Say what you mean and mean what you say. We, 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 have all the, we, we play all these verbal gymnastics, and we need to just be, you know, it, isn't, it isn't to say that we should be blunt, you know, and harsh. We should always be careful to be tactful and to frame our words in such a way that it's not hurtful, but we need to be truth talkers. We need to be people who are honest. We, we say what we mean. We mean what we say. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. By the way, where did James get that? He got it from his half-brother, Jesus, because Jesus himself in the Sermon on the Mount said, let your yes be yes and your no, no, and then this is what Jesus adds. James doesn't say this part, but in the rest of the verse, when, when, uh, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, let your yes be yes and your no, no, anything else comes from the evil one. That's challenging. He's saying, Jesus is saying, anything other than being honest and truthful and sincere is actually motivated by Satan himself, who Jesus said is a liar and the father of lies. So when we lie, when we deceive, when we, um, you know, manipulate, when we, um, you know, say things in, in order to get our way and all this kind of stuff, all of this, all of this verbal gymnastics, it's, it's not sincere talk. And Jesus said anything in addition to just yes, yes, no, no, is, is from the enemy. So words matter. Uh, a guy by the name of Rabbi Akiva, who lived just after Jesus, A.D. 50 to A.D. 135, he said, quote, a man might swear by his lips and annul it in his heart, and it was not binding, all right? That's nonsense, and, and Jesus clearly said even before that guy, again, let your yes be yes, your no, no. But Rabbi Akiva comes along and he says, you know what? You can say whatever you want, but in your heart, if you decide to change it up, it's okay. It's not okay. It's not okay. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. Words matter. And may I just add, not all speech in terms of words is verbal. Okay, especially in this age where your fingers do a lot of talking. Am I right? You get on your phones you, and, you, and you start posting things on social media with your fingers. You are just as accountable. It may not be spoken out of your mouth, it might be communicated through your fingers, either email or social media, but it's still communication and it still applies. And I think even more severely, here's why. Because when you say something with your mouth, as accountable as we still are, you might say that in the presence of one or two people. And they might forget, and over time, nobody remembers. But you say something through social media, you post it online, the whole world will see it, and it never goes away, ever. I mean, until Jesus comes and does away with everything. But, you know, and I, and I, tell, I tell young people, especially millennials and Gen Xers and Gen Zers, listen, you, you like to post stuff, it could cost you a job down the road because you're gonna post foolish stuff that later some employer is gonna Google you and look at some of your stuff and realize, this person isn't, isn't worth hiring, all right? Take, for example, politicians these days. They've been dogged by stuff they said 25 and 30 years ago that they're still dealing with. Why? Because it's out there and it remains out there. So whether we're talking verbal speech or written communication, we're still accountable. And again, perhaps even more so when you think of the ramifications of what electronic communication does and how it's out there for all the world to see. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 37, for by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. Words matter. Number five, he says, I want you to pray earnestly. In verse 13, he says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. 
Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. And he goes on to use Elijah as an example in verse 17. He says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. So let's back up here to verse 13 and talk about this a little bit, because he's talking about prayer in, in regards to two things, suffering and sickness. That's not the only reason, obviously, that, uh, that we should pray, but, but he's just calling out those two particular things. He says, is anyone there in verse 13, is anyone among you suffering, let him pray. And then he asks another question in verse 14, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing with oil in the name of the Lord. So this passage here describes the importance of prayer when we're going through difficulties and hardships and the suffering part. And then it also talks about praying for the sick. And I want to explain this section a little bit because this is something that we practice here at Cornerstone. And I always ask someone before we pray for them if they have a sickness, do they understand what I'm about to do when we get out this little vial of oil? Because James talks here about the elders of the church gathering and praying over someone who was a sick and anointing him or her with oil. And so um, this, this is something that God has simply prescribed as a method of, um, of, uh, a, uh, of praying for someone who is sick. And, and what he says here through James is, if you are suffering in some physical way, some illness, let the elders of the church, elders slash pastors, uh, anoint you with oil and pray over you. Now, there's nothing magic, and by the way, we're talking olive oil, but to be honest with you, it doesn't necessarily have to be. I, I, one of the guys who was influ influential in le leading me to Christ, or at least discipling me in my early years, I've talked about him before, his name was Buck Lewis. He owned the gas station on Main Street in Thurmont, Maryland. He had a third grade education, but he was a man most filled with the Holy Spirit than anybody had ever met, knew his Bible inside and out, and was just a guy who just modeled the love of Christ to me and uh, was just an amazing man. Well, he owns a gas station, he was a mechanic by hand. He had hands the size of catcher's mitts. You know, when you work with your hands, you get these big hands. And he would have people all the time, when Buck got saved, because if you've heard the story before, he was the town drunk. He was like Otis of Mayberry. And when he got saved, everybody heard about Buck Lewis getting saved. And they'd come to his gas station, not just to get work on their car and to pump gas, but if they needed prayer, because Buck Lewis was a man of faith. And there were times that I saw Buck Lewis anoint people with oil by pulling a dipstick <laughs> out of the engine of a car and sliding his fingers across that black oil and anointing people that's rubbing it on people and praying for them. So, yeah, I mean, just do whatever you need to do, right? There's nothing magical in the oil. Now, we, we use olive oil, and that's probably the context here. Uh, but, you know, th that's just what Buck would do. And, and then people would get healed, too, and they'd get saved. It was just an amazing thing. But James is giving us, giving us this instruction that there's nothing magical about the oil itself, but the oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Oil is symbolic. You know, in the Old Testament, when kings would be anointed, literally, to be set apart as kings, a prophet like Samuel for David would come and pour a, a flask of oil over the head of this king. And the oil was symbolic of the presence of the Lord. And, and so oil is symbolic of God's presence. So when we pray for someone, we anoint them with oil. And we just usually take a dab of it. It's not like we, you know, we drench you. You're not going to leave here sliding you know, all the way home. It's just, we just dab a little bit on our finger and we just gently rub it on your forehead and then, and then we pray for you because scripture invites us to do that. Now, I need to say this, the topic of healing has become a topic of either, in my opinion, great abuse in terms of the teaching regarding healing or great neglect. So you have, you have some who will say that everybody is always supposed to get healed if you just have enough faith and, 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 and pray. 
And you have others who say, you know, nobody gets healed today. That was a thing in the Old Testament, New Testament. And so the only way you get healed today is if, you know, you go to a doctor. And so we, we, thank, we thank God for doctors, but there's no supernatural healing today. So you have both of these extremes. And, you know, the thing about extremes is nobody should live there. All right. If, if you just read your Bibles, you'll live in the balance rather than the extremes. Fact of the matter is God still does heal people. But he doesn't, listen to me on this, he doesn't always heal everybody the way we think they should be healed. When you look at scripture, what we find is, typically, there are three ways that people will be healed. Medically, miraculously, or eternally. Now some people don't like that last one. The fact of the matter is there are some people that God just simply takes home and that's their healing. Sometimes we think exclusively related to this life and this world, that everybody needs to be prolonged to live longer here. And the truth is sometimes God just takes people home. I don't always understand that. I don't always know why some get healed in this side of heaven and some God chooses to take home. But again, that's part of God's perspective that we don't have. I thank God for doctors in medicine and, and you know, the medical community. Um, God certainly uses that to, as part of the healing process of our bodies that he has put within us. The body's an amazing you know, thing that God has created. And um, so there's that possibility of healing. But the reality is, friends, listen, you look at an example like in John chapter five. In John chapter five, the Bible says that Jesus is at the pool of Bethesda and it says there was a great, King James uses the word throng. It was a great throng, a great multitude, uh, the Bible says, of people who were sick lying around this pool there in Bethesda, which is in the old city of Jerusalem. And I, when we go to Israel, everybody who's been with me to Israel knows that's the Bible study at the pool of Bethesda, John chapter 5. Because in that scene, the Bible says there's a great multitude. How many does that represent? Hundreds, maybe thousands. The pool of Bethesda, when I first went to Israel, I thought it was just a little watering trough for animals. It is, it is the, they haven't even unearthed the whole thing. It goes under the Arab quarters. But as much as they've unearthed, it's the size of an Olympic swimming pool. So I want you to imagine hundreds, if not thousands of people sick around this pool. And the Bible says that there would be times that the waters would be stirred and people would rush in to try to be healed. Now, there's a lot of discussion, what's all that about? And some believe that the angel stirred the water and there was healing properties. You know, I pers personally think that God used some form of, um, you know, his presence to bring healing, you know, before Christ for the sake of people who needed it. Um, but it was a unique thing. Uh, obviously, if nobody was getting healed, then nobody would have been sitting around the pool of Bethesda. So something was happening there where God was supernaturally doing something. That aside, the Bible says that there was one man there who had been an invalid for 38 years. And Jesus stepped over all the other sick people. This is very challenging when you, when you and go home and read John chapter 5. A great multitude of sick were there. Jesus healed one and walked away. Okay, he, he healed the one to whom the Father directed him and he stepped over the others to bring miraculous healing to that one man who had been an invalid for 38 years. Now, why didn't he go around and heal every single person around that pool? Because God's God and God will sometimes heal miraculously and sometimes in our lifetime he will heal medically and sometimes he just simply heals eternally. That said, you should never stop praying because God might do the miraculous. And we should be people of faith, not faith in the results, that's the danger, but faith in God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what we could hope or imagine. Amen. And God still does do the miraculous. I hear people sometimes say, why can't we see all these miracles that we saw in the early church in the book of Acts? When you look in the book of Acts, there are about 30 miracles that happen over a period of about 30 years. So in proportion, I'm sure that there's a lot more of that going on in the world today as God is moving by his spirit and touching people and healing people. So we believe in the possibility that God still does heal people miraculously today. We don't stop praying for the sick because we believe by faith that God can. Our faith is in him and, and yet we leave the results up to the Lord.
So pray earnestly. I gotta rush through this because I'm already out of time. Number, number six, confess privately. He says here in verse 16, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So on this point, James is talking here about not just physical healing, but spiritual healing too. Because spiritual healing comes when we confess our sins and and when we get right with God. Now, this passage is not saying confess to each other instead of God. What he's simply, because God is the one to whom we must confess our sins. He's simply saying that there is this powerful healing aspect of our hearts that happens when we find a friend, a spouse, a confidant with whom we can privately, confidentially confess. Because here's the reality. When we keep secret sins secret, they have more power. And for those of you who who have had the courage to find someone that you know is a confidant and confess something that you've been struggling with, some sin issue, you know the liberating result of being able just to, I need to just tell somebody because this is just has a complete grip on my life. And so James is, is saying here that there's this benefit to confessing our trespasses or our sins to one another because it, there, it brings a healing to our soul. It, and, and it's good. And, and you know, there's accountability in that too, so that's a good thing as well. But um, the caution here is don't think that this means you have to go telling the world your sins. And the sad reality is that sometimes you think you have found a confidant and so you confess your sins and then they go around and they gossip about it and, and how tragic that is. And then here's what happens. You never want to tell another living soul what you struggle with because somebody blew your confidence. And by the way, the Bible warns about that kind of thing in Proverbs 11 and 13. It says, a gossip betrays a confidence, but a trustworthy man keeps a secret. And it, it's helpful sometimes to be able to say, to your spouse or your friend or, or a confidant, somebody you know that can hold your confidence. Here, here's my sin struggle. Here's what I'm struggling with or I did, and I just need to confess to somebody, will you pray with me? And, and that, that camaraderie in prayer and bringing things to the light um, exposes, you know, in Ephesians 5.11, Paul wrote, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness but rather expose them. Satan loves for us to keep stuff in the darkness. But when we come into the light, there's there's freedom in that, and and we find forgiveness. And so um, it's it's a good thing, and if you don't feel like you have somebody that that you can confidently share with, pray, pray for a person like that. Pray for a friend like that, so that you might have someone with whom you can entrust some of the deeper struggles, because bringing it into light does release the grip of that stronghold. Last one is to restore gently. In verse 19, he says, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Paul would write in Galatians 6, 1, something very similar with a caution. He says, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you too be tempted. In other words, in Galatians 6, 1, what Paul means is, if, if you are proud about, yeah, I'll restore you, you know, you, you stinking sinner, you know, I'll come alongside of you and help to get you back on the path, and you're not humble about it, guess what? You're liable to fall too. So he says, restore each other, restore a brother or a sister who's caught in a trespass in a spirit of gentleness, lest you too be tempted, because we can fall prey to the same thing that a brother or sister has fallen into if we're not careful. So approach restoration with gentleness and meekness and humility, because when you do, you turn a sinner from the error of his way and will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Jude 1.23 says, snatch people from the fire. That's our job. 
Not that we're any better than the next person, but if we help to look out for each other and love each other, and when a brother or sister falls, to restore him or her. That's a good thing, friends. We have a terrible thing in the church of shooting our wounded. We do, it's, it's sad. We need to be more careful about restoring the fallen than shooting our wounded, to be merciful and gentle and compassionate. That's our Lord. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for the book of James and how you, by your spirit, would exhort us in these ways. And we pray that you would help us, Lord, and to take these things to heart. Thank you for your word. Impress these things in our spirit as we go tonight back to our homes. We love you and thank you together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.